Yes. So this should be like this. And suppose it should be showing. Should be. And there you go. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in this panel. Uh, the name of the panel, uh, it's called Solidarity and Care. And we are here together to talk about uh, these different experiences that have been conducted lately in Chile that uh, are gathered around the idea of care and how care and solidarity become part of the everyday activities and entanglements that create and co-create life experiences, stories, subjectivity, and other issues. Um, considering that, today we have three presentations. Um, one of the two of the presenters, well, they, should, they were co-authors, uh, are not going to be able to make it to this presentation, sadly, because of personal issues. So uh, we'll only be having three presentations. First, uh, myself and Samantha will be presenting about uh, cities, care, and entanglements. After that, we have the presentation by Maria Alejandra Energesi and Nicolas Schengut called Fragile Entanglements, Enabling Death. And finally, we have the presentation by Carla Fardella titled Invisible Plots of Scientific Production, Friendship and Precariousness in Scientific Life. The idea is to be is to have more or less 20 minutes in, on each presentation. And after the three presentations, we can have like a, a, a period, a brief period for having a conversation, basically, uh, question and answer, so basically to just be able to engage with the work of each other and have comments and suggestions and just to hang out and think together. So with Nothing further to agree. Uh, we should start. Do you want to start with the presentation? Okay. Hello. Um, so today we are presenting Uncaring Cities, Entanglements of Children, Mental Health and Wellbeing in Urban Spaces. Um, this is the first year of a uh, research that is under development in, in Chile. We are hoping to understand in the three main cities of Chile um, how urban spaces are conceived and constructed, designed and inhabited um, by children. Um, just a little bit for you to know, Chile is a country in Latin America. It's a little, uh, it's a middle-income country, and ninety percent of Chilean children live in urban areas. Um, so, because of this, and because of the very important urban expansion that we've seen lately, it is very important to reflect on how we see children if we see them, and how we can uh, make this better. Um, on the first stage of this research, we interview experts uh, acting as consultants for urban design. We have interview academics, architects from the private sector, from civil society, and other actors from the public sector to understand how they see children when they design and think about the urban spaces. Okay. Oh, cool. Thank you. So uh, yesterday we presented part of this research in a different panel, but we want yesterday we stress a different aspect of the research that was mostly uh, entailed or linked to ideas of well-being. While today we want to use part of the same presentations, but we want to stress a different angle to it. And basically, what we want to do is to bring care into the uh, first, like into the front of the research, because part of what 
lately has been described and has been discussed about care precisely lies on the necessity that individuals, societies, and cities, nations, and basically all kind of human beings and non-human beings have in terms of dependence to each other. So care is a really interesting, a really powerful concept to think about the interdependency of life. And we think that being as important as it is, uh, it is weird for us. Uh, it was something that kind of shocked us in the beginning while designing this research, that care was not really a concept that has been fully addressed when thinking about cities, and especially when thinking about cities from this perspective. Although lately, care has become sort of a buzzword, right? It has been mm, a lot debated. Uh, lately, we, ho we have also seen uh, non-governmental agencies and governments asking for the construction and building and development of careful cities. Uh, as, we, as we were just saying, it has become a buzzword, but it has not been really fully deployed as a concept in motion, as something that is actually shaping the city. So just to give a brief overview of the concept, which probably you already know or are uh, acquaintance to, uh, care is a, an idea, a powerful idea that comes from mainly philosophy and mainly from a feminist perspective of philosophy. Care started as a opposite opposite concept, right? As an alternative to more traditional ideas of development. And under that consideration, uh, it has become really interesting to see how the concept has transformed over time. It went from describing mainly an inner feeling or emotion that kind of pushes towards action. Uh, we do things because we care about people. And under that idea, care was extremely linked with feelings of warmth, love, niceness, kindness. And thanks to transformations produced by SDS and posthumanist thinking, we have seen how care first is reshaped under this idea of relational ontologies and symmetric agency. Mainly what care brings into the table as a concept is the possibility to think that the world is basically a composition of entanglement, is a series, a series, a myriad of actors working together, stabilizing certain phenomena, certain entities. And in that stabilization of the phenomena, what we see is the possibility of action, right? So under that consideration, care becomes something that is think about as mainly relational, as mainly interdependent and uh, really connected to this idea of interdependence. So, okay. So uh, drawing from this inspiration in STS and posthumanist thinking, the noble ideas of care that we are using in this research uh, goes in line with the idea that although care is a human problem, it's important for us humans, is it not only a human issue? Like in that sense, care goes beyond human agency. And we think that's a really interesting point to think how uh, infrastructures, materialities, spaces can also become part of this care entanglement, can become part of the production of a specific or local forms of care that constitute the cities. So the composition of cities have been shaped by this, and I'm quoting our dear Kim Kuma here, the ideas that uh, cities have been shaped by ideas are often insensitive to human and non-human diversity and well-being. Mm -hmm. They work against this ethos of caring. So mainly, and we can see this in architecture, there's a whole bunch of architecture that is called like non-caring architecture. And you can probably see it in different spaces in Europe. Like there's this architecture that goes against homeless people so people can stay, uh, the creation of uh, uncomfortable places. And for instance, this is like a really naive example, but we, would, we went to a coffee shop because we needed to work 
and the coffee shop is designed so it doesn't have plugs or you don't have bathrooms. So it's a place in which you can't stay. You have to leave as early as possible. So this kind of development of spaces is also affecting the city. So and this, this idea, an STS approach, allow us to think how we can craft and involve skills and sensibilities that can attune to people and can help foster, sustain a better uh, entanglement for these relationships in relationship that can become more caring, sort of speaking. So, so far under this scope, we uh, have mainly produced interviews with experts, and we want to share some of these excerpts with you, uh, just to think together how these urban planners, architectures, and specialists of different kinds think about how the city can be caring and how the city can be caring in relation specifically to children. So do you wanna go with the quotes? Thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we've uh, already interviewed academics, um, people from the public sector and the private sector, civil society, aiming to understand how they see children when they design public spaces. And this quote we selected uh, was really interesting for us because she, uh, this academic makes the difference between places for children, which is where, when you need to design a place for children to be and places of childhood, which this academic thinks that it's everywhere. So it's not just about thinking about the public square where you get to see the playground, it's about seeing the mall, the bus stop, the supermarket, everywhere as a place where childhood is enacted. And in Santiago, this is a very important issue since, as I mentioned before, the urban cities have grown, grew as a very uh, unplanificated process. So what we see now is that most of the places that are designed for children, so not places of childhood, but places for children are designed in a very uh, specific way. So every playground is the same. They just all have the slide, the swing, plastic slide, plastic swing. Um, so they're not thinking about materials that could be better for an, an in a better situated place, um, but are more about how we think about places of childhood in, a, in in special places, but not in the whole city. Um, this quote we selected was also very interesting for us. Um, basically, this academic uh, is telling us that when we think about urban spaces, sometimes we design them and we think that when we design them and then build them, that's it for the urban space. But actually it is in appropriation of this space when we actually make it a use for this space that we uh, make it our own and that we can make, make it like um, a place that makes sense for us. And this academic makes this um, comparison with our house. So when you get your house, you paint it, you destroy it, you do things to it and basically owning the urban space should have a bit of this sense of what we do with our house so we should own this place so it's not about the design it's not about the construction it's about what happens after all of this process it was really interesting for us when we put the first quote and the second quote in line, like in relation one to another. Because if we think about um, the city as our house, and we think about it as a place which basically is constantly changing, when we think actually about our houses, uh, children are not confined to their room. Children move around the house and they can change things around the house. And basically, and probably you have this experience during the pandemic, the city, actually, the city, the house actually uh, shaped itself around 
uh, individuals' necessities, right? And the children have certain necessities. So we thought these two quotes actually talk to each other in a very interesting way, because when thinking about a city in which children inhabit, in which children live, uh, we can think about it only as places for children within the city. It's thinking about a city that is plastic enough, like flexible enough, that it can contain this mobility, this sort of unexpected actions, unexpected appropriation of public spaces, uh, and all that kind of things. So in that same sense, uh, this civil society architect talks about um, the needs of those who need care and who provide care. And it goes in the same line. Uh, when we think about, for, for instance, parks, right? You think about, okay, well, I'm gonna build a space for a place for the child. So I put swings and I put slides or whatever, like a sandbox. But he brings forth this idea like, okay, but this, is, this, is, there's someone supposed to be there with, with him, right? Or with her. So we need a bench, we need something else. So people are not by themselves, they're together. So the city in such a way um, the, the design of public urban spaces, uh, built public urban spaces, should, and this is what the Soviet society architect stressed, should follow also that rationale. Like it should be able to think about how different individuals inhabit public spaces. They're not meant just for one person, for what kind of person. You have everything. So you have a park for children, but children aren't similar to each other, that they are quite different. They have different ages and different necessities. And also within the same age range, the same, uh, they are different. They have different skills and different needs. So that's something that starts showing in the interviews. Uh, you, but, but. Um, so something we've, we've been thinking about, it's about how in Chile we have this idea about the importance of um, participation when we design spaces. Uh, but when we think about participation, it also brings about a, a matter of power struggles. So in the case of this quote, we see that um, this academic that also is part of a social organization, it's bringing this thing about when government comes to a place and they try to do something at the place like to design a public space um, they sort of shoot against the organizations that are in this place already and try to design new ones and in the case of this quote this person is saying that this is wrong because these kind of organizations are the ones that know what this neighborhood needs um, because they care about the territory, they care about the environment, they care about everyone there because a social organization's essence is to care. Um, and we've been thinking about this a lot because, of course, designing a place with the participation of everyone around this place, it's very important, but it does not solve the problem completely. There is a relational thing that we're not seeing. So in this case, um, of course, this organization does know what the territory needs, but there are other needs that maybe are not um, mm. taken but by this organization. Yeah. So um, this is why we think that using this relational approach is very important when we think about these urban spaces, especially for children mm. who usually are not part of these kind of organizations. And this final code, it's about diversity. So Sebastian already said a bit about it. Uh, this academic is talking about how the world, how the cities, how everywhere is made up by diverse people, by diverse necessities, by multi-generational encounters. And in this sense, we see this relational um, approach, which is very important when we think about these spaces. But basically what we see is that the architect is thinking from their perspective and the social organization is thinking from their perspective. So there is no um, approach that actually 
thinks about these relationships when they design about these public spaces. And this is really uh, important when we also think about children mm -hmm. uh, who are not part of any part of this uh, relational approach. So just to uh, sum up some of the preliminary conclusions that we have had are mainly ideas and mainly things we have thought while analyzing the interviews. So there's a couple of things that sort of uh, cut out our attention. First of all, the this idea that if we think about producing or thinking or reflecting upon how to build a city for children, and if we take care issues seriously, uh, it's really complex to think about the city for children because children are not by themselves. So when we go into thinking along some uh, scholars such as Maria Puccio de la Bella Casa, we need to think about care as a relational phenomenon. So a city for children is not really a city for children. It's a city for a bunch of different people in which children are also included. And we think that mainly one of the first things that came to our minds is that the main omission in the planning of city is precisely the idea of different actors. But building a city for children does not mean, does not entail to forget other actors. Actually, it's the opposite. It's trying to include all possible actors and, and turning uh, the planning and designing a city or city spaces into a matter of care. It's actually bringing forth different concerns, preoccupations, ideas, and trying to make them talk to each other and convey in some way. So that way we can produce a city that can be cared for in return. People like Bruno Latour call like a monster technology, something that is abandoned because it doesn't represent anyone. So the design, production, and reproduction of urban public spaces is understood as a home. And we think this is a really nice idea because the home is for everyone that lives in the home. Like everybody has a specific place, but the home as a whole belongs to everybody. So everybody can circulate for all parts. Everybody can change things. And we are all ready to take care and repair that place through the process. So this idea, really uh, careful, it's a really beautiful idea, crashes against ideals of rationality, planning. It usually comes uh, at the basis of public planning, uh, designing, in which the idea of order, of authorship of different kinds, it's quite powerful. So uh, it's, dif it's difficult for architects or planners to let control go and say, okay, whatever happens to this place is now part of the ones who inhabit this place. So one of the second conclusions we have so far is the idea of uh, the difficulties to thinking about this participation and inclusion of children in urban spaces, mainly because uh, they don't feel these places as their own now. It's, it's hard to include somebody to care about something that doesn't feel that it belongs to them. So careful thinking for us is, is a process in which this location and spaces can go beyond and above this expert. It, they can, it can traverse those interests and turn these places into places for them. So this goes for, for our opinions so of beyond the classic or traditional ideas of uh, participation, uh, it, it goes beyond representation of children in the planning of the city. It, it, it requires something else. We're not quite sure what exactly, but you know, it's something else. Um, finally, uh, just some questions that have uh, arise during this process, uh, how to produce these urban spaces where the agential capacities of diverse collectives can be included in such a way that sustain these spaces, and that is experienced as a shared task what we were talking before, like how to make diversity uh, or diverse agents to fill this place as their own so they can actually care of these places. How to include this diversity and how can care as a concept and as a method become a gathering purposes in order to follow and actually try to achieve this. 
uh, ideal. So thank you so much for your attention. And now we got I think now. So I think in, let's leave our questions and comments and so we can make a discussion at the end. I think it's, it's better. Okay. The, the, it's showing the, the, the presentation shows how much time is left. So, yes. It's recording already. Okay. So let me see. This is the one. Okay. And let me. I should. I should let me just take a bit to upload. And but you do fine. Okay. So you can go okay. through here, and it's showing the. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, I, I did a little bit of a change on the title of the presentation. It's Fragile Entanglement, Entanglements of Care um, because I think death wasn't like a central issue uh, in the research. Um, what I'm going to present, it doesn't look like it has uh, technology or science like it's at, it, at its heart or core. But I think it has to do with also how we understand technology and science, because I think like everyday objects are actually technological objects. Today, we, for example, if we think about that chair, that chair is actually um, a technological object. It has science, it has agronomics, it has how it got here with engineers, et cetera. So, I'm gonna work with a, a very broad, or maybe different idea about um, technology and science. So um, care is a place of inequality. Um, I'm not gonna go uh, into how in unequal is uh, in gender and in a gender uh, matter. For example, 75% of the unpaid work in the world, it's made by girls or, or women. But uh, so uh, that, that's a lot. There's a lot of evidence there. I'm not going to go into it. But care is essential, as the last presentation we could see. It's uh, essential to daily assemblage of the work. So uh, however, and I think this is also a political issue because it's something made by, by, by women, despite its crucial role, the practice of caregiving is often undervalued. Yeah, and the daily burden it represents is highly unequal. So this already uh, reflects uh, gender-based disparity. I'm gonna work with the concept of transcorporality. Uh, this is an idea that we become, that we are assembled at some point, we materialize in an entangle of biological, technological, economic, social, political, and other systems, processes, and event as at a vastly different scale. We become there, we, we're, all, we're not only part of them, we also have a very active, as I will show, interaction with them. So what I'm gonna present, it's part of a, a research where we ask people uh, to tell us about their bodies. I'm, I'm gonna show you a little bit of that. This research didn't have originally the idea of care, actually. We had like, we had diff, a sample, that was distributed of men and women from 30 to 45 years. But what we got at the point when we started to analyze it was that, it was that caregiving was actually a very, very important and crucial issue. And that it was very different what care did for, uh, it, it determined women and men's life in a very different way. Actually, it didn't determine men's life. When you read an interview made to a woman, you know she has children, for example, like in the third line. You, you can easily recognize because her life is very marked by the issue. When you read the interviews made 
two men, you sometimes don't know if they actually have children or they were, I don't know, appear in the almost at the end of the interview. So um, it, it's to effectively com convey your research outcomes. What we did was craft two composite narratives. Yeah, um, we want to account for a day in the life of a ma male caregiver, while the second the second narrative accounts for uh, a day for a female ca caregiver. So um, what we did was like to condense in a narrative of one day, the key elements of what was very common to each of the interviews. And to remain faithful to the interview's affect, we assign a fictional names to the participants. We didn't want to put a code then. So uh, what we did was a very, very simple uh, interview, but it was very impressive how being that simple, it gave us so much information. So because of the body is a very moral place, when you talk to people about their bodies of, for example, uh, sex practices, food, etc. People tend to, uh, it, it's a very, I don't know if it's a social. Como? Okay, it's it's very crossed by social disability. So people is gonna say like the moral issues come very easily, and people don't are not gonna tell you about their lives. So because we didn't we didn't want this, we work with two things. Uh, the first one was uh, the gender of the interviewers and the interviewees. I don't know how you said it correctly, but actually from a research we had before, we realized that men talk to men and women talk to women a lot more. And secondly, what we did was to ask if your body could speak in pictures, how will it tell the story of its day? This had two very important components. The first one is that we ask for the body. What will, what will your body say, not what you will say? And the second one was that to talk through pictures, it, it helped it a lot for uh, people get a little bit rid of this moral idea and start this narrative about moral mor morality around the body. So what we had in mind was all these subjects about food decision, exercise, aesthetic care, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, usually this, Kind of these themes came like uh, spontaneously during the interview, but we still have like all these points uh, on on our mind. So in case that one of them w didn't appear in the interview, then at the end of the interview we will ask ask it directly. So it was, it was a very simple uh, uh, instrument, but it was a really uh, fruit fruitful one. So today, um, because of time. Uh, I'm going to present only uh, the women's um, press, uh, narrative, the, the narrative we constructed to um, account for women experience and women and women interviews. And um, and I'm going to um, remark only in two points. We have like six that we have <clears throat> identified. The first one is Marta. That's how we, we name uh, the first. Um, the, the the women of the story, and uh, she has a life of diminishing, disassembled, and reassembling. We're gonna see her existence. So, uh, Marta's activities blend without clear demarcation of morning, afternoon, and evening, creating continuous work-life flow, where days transition seem seamless into one another. One of the first problems we had when we wanted to create a narrative about women's life it was that there was a lack of the classical temporality. Their days didn't begin in the morning. So um, it was very difficult to actually construct a narrative. And that already that already tells you something, right? And what you have is that actually we, we put a starting point arbitrarily and because many of them started their, their day the night before, that's why we use that as the, the starting point, but actually you could use um, mostly any of them. So it could be like any moment. Um, Marta, we 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 said uh, she's a woman like in her 40s, she's married, she has been married for uh, for 15 years and she has two daughters. That's like a, a very typical family in Chile. 
So uh, her day, we started that she stayed, as I said, the night before, and she says she typically finishes cooking between 10 p.m. and 12, and uh, it's 12 p.m., I'm sorry. I know, 12 a.m. Uh, laying out her clothes for the next day in anticipation of her limited time in the morning. Uh, she's the first to rise after only five or six hours of sleep. By 5.30, she already, uh, she's already busy fa finalizing the lunches for her daughters to take to school and preparing their breakfast. Her day seamlessly flowing from one responsibility to another without a clear divide. So she's even doing house chores uh, during, she only stops to sleep, but sleeping doesn't kind of stop the, the chores. It's a continuum. So the first uh, thing I'm gonna remark has to do with eating patterns. How does she eat? The idea of parasitic eating, it's uh, from a Brazilian uh, paper where the authors saw that mothers tend to eat in a paras parasitic way that has to do with like taking food from the children. So uh, she eats this way. So what she eats in the morning when she is making breakfast for the, the, her daughters, has to do with um, to take part of the bread the 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 the, the daughters prepare for him, from themselves, and when we ask her why if she has breakfast, she says no because they have a rabbit. So this this rabbit is um, a pet, and she has to make sure that the rabbit gets water and food. So it's interesting that even the rabbit it's eats breakfast. <laughs> it's very sad actually, but. Um, so the rabbit has food and water and she doesn't. So what she does is that she eats something of, of, from, the, of, from the kids' breakfast, something that was left. And then what's interesting is that outside the school, there's this woman that, send, that sells coffee. So she, she grabs a coffee there. This is not a coffee shop. I, I want to be very clear about this. It's kind of a, it's very informal business. It's not like she stays at a, co a coffee shop to, to drink coffee. No, she just grabs a coffee out of school at, 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 at when she lives. Uh, so she consumes the solid components of her breakfast, such as bread, at home, while the liquid portion, her coffee, is spitted at her daughter's school. Sip it, I'm sorry. Consequently, her breakfast, it's not a single concise occasion, but a segmented process unfolding in different spaces and at varying times, deviating from the traditional sit-down meal. So we can see that spaces and spaces uh, her eating structures her spaces and temporality in a very different way because of caring. The second point I wanna I wanna stress that I already said this uh, and I already pointed out that's becoming through a continuum in space and temporality. So what does she does when she gets back to school? She enters the house. She she returns very uh, very fast and because of her caring role, what she has done is to have a store in the front of her house. So this allows her to do paid and unpaid work at the same time. This is actually a little bit not, uh, this is not concise. She's actually not doing simultaneously. Uh, it has been very, it has been established that women tend to do multitasking, right? And it has been shown also that it has a, a very, uh, it, it provokes neurological damage to multitask, okay? But what she is doing, it, has, it hasn't to do that much with um, multitasking. It consists more in dividing the, the, the task in, is in very different and very small steps so she can recombine them in a very, um, in a way that she can, she can work with everything she has in her hands. So, um, what we have here, for example, it's that uh, we comprehend her existence as a becoming where ages it is articulated with a continuum, entangled in the intersizes of public and private, the paid and the unpaid. The concepts we have to understand and divide a world as public and private, paid or unpaid, don't make sense to read her existence. This domain materializes as interwoven in, a, in ways that defy the clear separation, creating a tapestry where distinction blur and her agency emerged th through the interplay of this intricate connect strands. So what we have here is that uh, her, her world is 
um, very intertwined where everything looks like the same for her are not different spaces or, or temporalities. Everything is kind of intertwined. And in that context she is uh, she still gets articulated with some agency that is this about cutting and she has a very a very complex strategy to to do this because she is decomposing but at the same time this de decomposition allows her to uh, deal with a very different and flexible contingency because it's not every day the same day so she has this organized in a way that it can deal with a very uh, different different day different um demands um because of time i'm not going to go on on very in a very in a very uh in, in a deep sense on this other four points. But what we had, for example, that appears as, as, uh, as very strong um, issues was, the first one was pain. Because of the sample, and we interviewed people between 30 and 45 years old, we didn't think that pain was gonna be an issue. It was actually an issue we had to add after doing the first interviews because people would talk us a lot, a lot about pain. Um, it was kind of uh, odd, but people are kind of used to live with pain. We didn't think about this, but people tend to, you think that people when have pain will do something about it. They actually don't. They kind of uh, get, get get used to living with pain, men and women, but, but of course, mainly women. So when we ask her if she has pain, if she experiences pain, because she has a very demanding physically, physic job. Most of women have a very demanding physic job. Uh, what she says is that, um, for example, because she has a store, she has to put everything in order. She has to iron because the, it's a secondhand used uh, clothing and et cetera. What, when we ask her if she has pain, she says, no, I don't. But then she says, well, when I stop at the, at the afternoon for a while to have a, a cup of tea, what she actually says, she says, I take my tapsin tea. Tapsin tapsin is a... It's a it's a hot beverage with um, with paracetamol, which is acetaminophen. So, so she actually takes a medicine every day to relax. So th that's how, and she doesn't see it as a medicine, which is also has to do with this entanglement. For her, it's food. So medicine and food are not different objects for her. Uh, on a second remark, aesthetic choices was very interesting. This was a project in a very broad sense about... Um, beauty ideals. And what we expected was that uh, beauty ideals will be important for women because there's a literature about that and because uh, we have like that um, prejudice about women. Um, what we find that our hypothesis didn't appear like at all in any of the interviews. Uh, women were not concerned about beauty standards, like not at all. What we had was that uh, aesthetic choices were made in a very pragmatic logic. This has to do like they will think, what do I have to do this day? And they will use the most, the most versatile choice that would allow them to go through the day without changing the clothing. So it was a very pragmatic uh, choice. And what we said, what we saw in the men interview was actually they made a lot of more um, decisions concerning beauty ideals. So on the contrary that most of us will believe. Uh, resting has to do with doing nothing. Th that's the, the resting that will say they do. It's like being still in a couch or in the bed, uh, watching the cell phone, seeing, watching a series, a series but it, it will be around 20 minutes, not more, but it has to do with kind of nothingness, like doing nothing and it's not an activity. Actually, one of the women talk about active resting. She said, well, when everyone will go to bed and I can iron the, clo the clothes alone, it, it's an active resting. It has to do with doing only one thing at the same time. She, will, uh, she understands doing only something at the same uh, at the time, it's, it's resting. And of course, exercise routine were unexistent. We had to ask to ask them. This wasn't, uh, wasn't surprising. Uh, studies, statistic data in Chile shows that women actually don't exercise uh, after they have their first, their first child exercise like drops. 
there are some groups where uh, exercise is unexistent, actually. Um, and it's very, 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 uh, it has to do a lot with care. For example, when women, she was a high socioeconomic status. So she said, oh, I have uh, diabetes. I start having diabetes. And the doctor said, I have to exercise. And she start exercising. She start walking. And uh, her husband and the boy didn't like to reheat their food in the microwave. So they asked her if she could please stop doing exercise. Chile is uh, a country where if you are high status, uh, you can actually hire a maid. That's a possibility. And her husband didn't like having a maid. So it was kind of for her, it was very natural to understand that exercise wasn't an option for her. So uh, final remarks, Marta's existence materializes within the nexus of transcorporality, where she's both constituted by and constitute a continuum that interwines biological, economic, social, and political issues. Her becoming is not merely situated in this interlacing. Through this entanglement, she materializes her reality and reality materializes her. Marta's agency emerged in this intricate mesh as she navigates and ne negotiates the co this continuum embodying the essence of a transcorporeal existence. She only, it's, she only becomes and uh, it's materialized and her agency it's defined and in this entanglement. Thank you very much. So let me just um, so stop sharing. Right, yeah, she can. Okay, so now we have uh, our final presentation of this uh, panel that is by Carla Fardella call Invisible Plots of Scientific Production. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. So uh, it's time, it's 20 minutes, and you should just like switch. To Gracias. The... <laughs> OK, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, honestly, I don't feel comfortable uh, speaking in English. So um, sorry for that. But uh, considering that this is a panel about care, um, I have Sami, <laughs> a good friend of mine, so he's going to help me. Okay. Um, in this presentation, I want to share with you uh, some results of a research program started in 2015. In general, we have been trying to understand the, the reorganization of research work and the work identity of scientifics. Uh, considering the changing regulation of science, um, it's very important for us to understand identity work of these uh, scientifics and also uh, the impact that this has on uh, scientific knowledge. Okay, so, see? the outline of this presentation first i want to present you the background uh, of chilean uh, scientific production uh, the i already said the proposal the the pro el propósito the purpose. the purpose of this uh, research and then some uh, results mm, okay Chile has been a successful case of uh, scientific production improvement. Uh, esta parte es tuya, Sami. 
<risa> Primero, eh, la, el gobierno ha dado tres veces más dinero de lo que ha dado en las últimas décadas. Eh, se triplicó el presupuesto, lo puedes decir. Eh, el número de doctores en Chile eh, se triplicó. Also the number of PhD programs, oh no, uh, doctors. Well, sí. So the number of PhD um, person has triplicated. Los programas también. Uh, PhD programs have triplicated as well. <laughs> okay, so scientific work is reorganized by this new culture and also new values. Uh, such as competence and um, performance, or high performance. Um, so how has this new scientific culture been installed? Uh, first, the uh, Ministry of Science and University redesigned uh, his management devices. Um, but uh, so what we uh, what do we mean by management devices uh, teaching evaluation instruments um, performance parameters parameter? uh, and a lot of instruments for productivity recording and tracking our work um, and also you will see uh, in the papers or specific literature about uh, scientific work, you will find alignments and misalignments uh, from scientific to this new regulation. Um, so our question, I don't know, wait, this part is very difficult to explain, Sam. Uh, ustedes se pueden preguntar cómo los instrumentos de gestión transforman el trabajo académico. So you may wonder how these instruments uh, transform the scientific work. Um, uh, it's about uh, socio-technical procedures sí. uh, where you can see the different tasks of a scientific, put it in a sheet, sheet board, okay. uh, and you will see that the different tasks will have more value, o sea, más valor, mm -hmm. uh, like research of more value than uh, teaching. Mm -hmm. So they prescribe something that they that the instrument say that they represent, but they also prescribe some task. Mm -hmm. See? Okay, you understand? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they classified uh, computers and organize the value of the different tasks of a research. Okay, our research problem is to characterize the transformation of research labor and scientific careers in the, con in the context of these policy reforms. Uh, we ask things like, how does it challenge scientific activity? How do research community perceive their own work, but also, uh, remarking the different kind of scientific, you know, successful research, early research, but also woman research and non full time research. Okay, our methodological this decisions, design, yeah. but also decisions, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> both. <laughs> uh, Nosotros nos enfocamos en esta, los resultados de ahora se enfocan en la etnografía institucional y el análisis colaborativo. So during the first year they did a documentary analysis, on the second year they did narrative analysis of identities, the third year they did ethnography of institutions and on the fourth year they did a collaborative, collaborative analysis. The presentation today will focus on the two last uh, stages. Okay, maybe you can uh, you will ask what is a collaboration analysis analyze analyze analysis. Um, Tammy, o sea, Sammy. <laughs> Entonces, lo que hicimos simplemente es poner fragmentos 
de las narrativas uh -huh. del año 2020 uh -huh. eh, al centro de un grupo de investigadores y hacer una interpretación colaborativa. So, for the collaborative analysis, they took um, posts or um, excerpts of the narrative analysis done on the second year, and they placed this um, post in extracts on the table and got experts and academics to um, think about the result and analyze them together. Yeah, genial. Eh, relevant results. Eh, y aquí quiero presentar eh, las complicidades, ok, complicities and mismatch eh, de los académicos eh, con los nuevos sistemas de regulación. Okay, so what she's going to present now is about, about complicities and mismatches on, uh, uh, from academics with this new, um, ¿cómo dice los sistemas de regulación? Sí. O los eh, management devices. Ah, esta la, la puedes leer tú, Sammy. Mm -hmm. So, um, this quote says, the university as a teacher proposes a schedule. Um, does it tell you how to comply? This person replies, no, no, I don't have a schedule. I don't have a free schedule. Um, if I don't come one day, no one controls me. The only thing I cannot do is miss a class, but the rest of the time, it's on me. But I still need, I, I, I don't have enough. I work on Saturdays and Sundays. I still don't have enough time. Yeah. Esta, este fragmento es, es muy representativo de la manera en que los profesores eh, interactúan con los sistemas de regulación. Ya, sobre todo por, la, por lo contradictorio. Ok, if you can understand the, ¿cómo se dice cita? Quote, uh, you will see that he uh, se, se posiciona de manera autónoma al mismo tiempo okay. que es un esclavo. A esta narrativa la hemos llamado voluntarismo mágico. So this narrative has been called magical voluntarism. Porque tienen la expectativa o la fantasía de controlar mucho más de lo que en realidad controlan. Because they have this fantasy that they control time, but they actually don't. Y no solo tiempo, los procesos de trabajo, la capacidad de competir. And not only time, but also process and ability to compete and many other things. Si pudiéramos ponerle una imagen a esto. Pondríamos una jaula de oro. It would be a golden cage. Por la capacidad de encerrar al académico a la vez que hacerlo brillar. La complicidad número dos eh, es interesante porque habla eh, de cómo la pasión eh, se anuda al a la autoexplotación. So, complicity number two is really interesting because it shows a knot between and self exploitation. So, evaluation and metrics return a positive self image to successful scientists and an identifi identification with their scientific products. A uh, knot is shown between patient for work and self exploitation. Uh, this facilitates commitment to management uh, work devices. But not everything is so sad. We will find also uh, some resistance practice in everyday life. Uh, 
that has been called by the by our research group uh, the mismatch. Uh, so number one, we have called competition uh, versus solidarity. Uh, I'm going to uh, listen the quote. I don't know if it's correct or not. When I was pregnant, my friend put me as a co-author co of a paper. She knew that my contract as a research would depend on it. It was survival. We can find a lot of quotes uh, describing uh, positive things or solidarity fragments or even care situation between uh, researchers. And it's very interesting to think that in in context of high competition, you will find always a resistant practice of care, um, things like this. But also, uh, you can see how researchers or or scientific also find in friendship the place to talk about feelings, uh, like vergüenza, shame, or uh, fear. Um, like this situation, you know, she is carrying me. <laughs> she is carrying me, yeah. Taking care, go. Taking care of me. Taking care of me. Uh, friendship at work is fundamental to resignify mm -hmm. uh, the experience of failure. Um, the scientific space is preg impregnated with affects. It encourages reparation, endurance, and irony. Y la ironía es necesaria para tomar distancia. Próximos pasos. Next steps. We are going to ask uh, how precarity, competition, entity, or solidarity affect the construction of scientific knowledge. Um, not only the identity of scientific. So, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so... Um, let me just, um, <clears throat> okay, so it's, okay, I'm, I'm just worried that might close this soon, hopefully not, okay, not, okay, so now we have, uh, some time to talk and discuss and do questions, so different things, uh, I just wanted to start with a brief comment about the presentations and start also with a question, obviously. But, uh, huh? See. yeah, you can also, you can come closer, of course. Yeah, it's much less formal that way. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, what do you, what, when we think about the, the different presentations and different experiences, and this is part of what we were thinking about when we put this panel together uh, it's just like how in different settings care becomes something that is ever present like it's something that is happening or it's being neglected it kind of grant us a lens to think about different experiences like from building and thinking about a city to thinking about uh, how we cope with failure on our careers and <laughs> and grants, <laughs> and so many other things that happen in the academic world to, to everyday life. Uh, how I was just thinking about something you mentioned, how like sometimes we have to decompose for the people to live and thrive, which is a really sad aspect of care, but it's care still, right? So in a way, yeah, we thought about care and solidarity and how solidarity can come as an auxiliary concept to care, as a way to think, to feel with people who care and help them care as well. Uh, so that being said, yeah, of course, let's have a brief discussion, comments, questions. Um, I can start, I have a question about Marta. Uh, 
poor Marta, who is not doing great. Uh, it's very uh, sick. Yeah, <laughs> it's not great. Uh, no, but it's just like it's it, it amazed me uh, how to. I mean, the way she, the way it becomes so natural for us to think about uh, decomposing for others, and obviously that's partially because of culture, like our culture in Latin America, it's, it's really like self-sacrificing. It's a better female motherly thing to do. Uh, but also I was wondering while you were having these conversations with her, if she didn't realize how this can be resignified as something not great, right? Like when she's talking about these things, uh, because there's something that is actually quite interesting when thinking about this, like a motherhood, that is, do you give everything, you suffer, like this woman suffer, but it's also this a certain aspect of, I don't know, it's like uh, pride in doing so, or uh, it's not pride, but like what when she's talking about this, what keeps her going and going and going? How, how do you feel about that? How do you think about that? When she talks, I was thinking about irony. She laughs, actually. Okay. They, they were laughing. As we were laughing, for example, this morning, um, I received a call from my daughter, like, who's going to pick me at school? No one has come for me. And I thought, I'm literally the farthest person in this moment for her to call <laughs> and feel for me. So, um, oh, and then. or she had like <laughs> five minutes later, she was called because there was a lead, Piojos, there was a lead like epidemic on the school. So, uh, yeah, lies, lies. lies. So, I, I don't know if you question it. Uh, when you read like the Women's Day and the Men's Day, um, they are different lives. Like, you don't see them, like, they don't live in the same world. It's, it's kind of shocking. Uh, for me, very difficult to write the Men's Day. I got mad. I had to send it to my research assistant. And put him. Does this still make sense? Because I, I got really mad reading it. And I think it has to do also because you uh, women, I think, about the couch experience, you you grew up in a world that's not designed for you. So I think that that it's very part of this experience because, for example, public and private space, mm. it's a very, like, we take it as something natural, actually. And, women don't have public and space. It's a very male way of habitating the world. Mm. So you're kind of used that you have to be adapting constantly to a world that's not designed for you. And so many things, not only not, not only space, time, uh, it's in everything. For example, you, this book, Kevin uh, Gallo Perez, Invisible Women, it shows how, how many objects and how the world is not designed. I love the quote about the cars, for example. Mm. Or, well, chairs, but, but um, the safety on the cars has to do with uh, 17 uh, cars because they're, they're designed for male bodies, mm. the average male body. So uh, if a woman gets uh, injured, in a, uh, women have a 47% more pro probability to get um, seriously injured in a car accident and 17% 17, 17 uh, higher possibility of gain of dying in the same accident. Okay. So you're kind of used to being in a world that you're kind of adapting to. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of like your experience. I think one of the ways of dealing with it is laughing. And, mm -hmm. and they laugh actually when they tell you. It's very important that because that you have a woman interviewing a woman because she knows like she's going to get it. So we're going to laugh about this. Uh, and I think mm. laughing, it's very kind of, um, uh, maybe I will include that, that they tell this laughing, not as a victim position. No, not at all. Mm. I think it's really interesting to think about like this coping mechanism, sort of speaking, right? Like you have to keep going in a way. And when you were mentioning this whole bit about uh, growing in a world that is not fit for you, it's not designed for you. Uh, yesterday we were in, in a presentation with Samantha and they were talking about sounds. And it's really interesting how the city is filled with sounds, but who get to choose which sounds are those that like populate the city. And I used to have this 
discussion with my friends, like for instance, when we're driving to school, like I, and, and this is a conversation with, I think, want to stress our friends. <laughs> uh, because uh, usually when I'm driving, my the kids can select music. It's like, okay, we choose one song each. Like I get one, you get one, you get one. Uh, I talked about this with my friends and they were like, no, how are they going to ever like realize what is good music? I'm like, what is good music? The music I like, but that's the, the answer. But it's amazing because uh, they erase and they absorb uh, whatever somebody else thinks fits them or it's best for them. But it's this so little agency in such like little decisions that can actually make such a big difference. Uh, so yes, yeah, women, it's children, is well, basically everyone that is not men. Right. Yeah, middle age, like, you know, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So yeah. Can I just test something? You know, when I heard a lot of the you can always see the care and relationality and family. Um, so someone in Mark's position might sometimes feel like it's empowered by kind of passively moving along, uh, responding to the different requirements that they need. That mesh work to achieve things. But how she practice self care? You she mentioned does. irony, but you mentioned irony, that's a way of taking distance, that's a way of creating a kind of time and space and how we move from that and yeah. that mesh work. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned doing nothing. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, could that be care as well? You know, severe and even momentarily relationships. And yeah. Could you be? Have a different lens to think about care and to, to really recognize those, those significant moments. Like in Margaret's case, how, how does she practice self care? Uh, it, it's doing nothing. Uh, what is it doing about doing one thing? Uh, at some point, they say, I will really, I really, really rest on the weekends when father takes the children out. So it's actually have it as a stillness, like being on the couch, on the bed moving it's it's very sad also when you compare it with self-care that i think that's again a very masculine conception of care men have a very a much more uh, active idea and activities of care so they'll go uh, outside they will go to do activities with the children they will have sports they have like kind of something that uh fills the resting and actually for women for or Marta, when we interview, resting has to do with uh, resting something, like taking out. And the less things they have, the better. That's what you're doing. Uh, and phone, for example, watch, watching things on their phone or uh, watching uh, something on Netflix uh, sometimes has to do with timing, actually. For example, I see an episode that's 20 minutes. So I know. It, I only stop for 20 minutes because I more than 20 minutes. It has to do with some kind of evitative, like when uh, not uh say with that to mm -hmm. avoid to avoid activity. So I'm we have actually also a joke about that. Like I get some activities that allow you not actually to be doing something, but to kind of ignoring what's happening around you. So mm -hmm. that's also so yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad, but it's true. Like, uh, so it has to do with rest, like, um, like taking out things. Mm. So resting has to do with as much things that you can take out, the better. And the more still you can be, the better. So, uh, so this idea of taking care of doing act, um, uh, to add things to your life, mm. I think it's a very masculine idea. That's really fascinating. That that act of subtraction, mm. and and I, I would say. In relational things, in terms of um, yeah. um, attachments, relationships, families, we tend to think in additive ways. We yeah. add elements to your assembly, yeah. you know, in a way that makes sense. Whereas in this case, you, you subtract them. To me, that's really fascinating. Mm. You take out things to create gaps, gaps to look forward to, really. Yeah. In life. But in a way, this anticipation she does of her activities is also a self-care practice. 
like she knows she has to do a lot of things, so she's cooking the day before, so she actually can make it on the way in the morning, and she knows that she's going to have her be outside of the school. So all of these anticipation, like a schedule, maybe is a well of self care as well. Uh, and I don't know if it is self care. I think it's all a management uh, strategy. Yeah, I think it's. If she didn't optimize her time. Because, uh, yeah, but the first thing she's going to sacrifice if she doesn't have time, it's, for example, her coffee outside, outside mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it has to do with self-care. It may be kind of allows. I, I don't like to call it self-care because I think it has to do more with survival. So mm -hmm. calling it like survival mm -hmm. strategies, self-care, I think it's, yeah. yeah, I think it's a very, like, it's politically, I wouldn't yeah. like that. So yeah, I think it has to do like more. Preservation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for example, um eating it's kind of nu nutrition not about like food like having mm. this experience of sitting and doing food and sharing with people yeah, no like gasoline it's gasoline. gasoline yeah excellent analogy it's like gasoline like oh mm. i haven't eaten and, and, and oh, maybe i had i need protein i haven't eaten enough protein so yeah. i need water i was thinking that the real uh, resistance to practice in this context is for example if for pleasure for example yeah, I, I think yeah. I, I was thinking about the whole like self care, and I think self care is a is a really uh, annoying word uh, in many ways because it gets to the idea that everything you do for yourself is actually self care, and most of the things people do for themselves is actually surviving. And and self, if we we go back to this sort of, like original idea about care, care is supposed to help you thrive, not mm -hmm. survive. Uh, and I think it's, it's it's interesting. Like if you're just doing it to keep yourself alive, you're not actually caring, you know. It's like, like you're saying, yeah. Talking about care being part of daily life, I'm really curious. Um, in Martha's situation, because obviously it's not sustainable. Like, I, I'm not sure how long she can go on for without self care, without maintaining her health. Right. Mm. I'm wondering if there were any instances throughout the day where she paused and thought, like, is what I'm doing actually care? Um, is that a point where care is unrecognizable or care is, you know, mm. unfair? Uh, uh, okay, let me ask you, if in some moment you have to think about it during the day, like, how do you take care of it and how do you take care of it during the time? Um, that's why I called the presentation at the beginning. Uh, that's what is in the program about death, because actually it doesn't stop. Yeah. Like, in Chile, women live longer than men, but in very, very, very um, uh, several conditions. Like mm -hmm. the, the survival rate is higher, but the life uh, quality is very, very low. I remember uh, 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 a thesis, a thesis are supervised uh, over um, about older women, and they were their happiest years because their spouses died. We have we have that a lot in Chile. Like she was miserable until her husband died, and then her life boomed. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, so so yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. It's difficult for me to to like um, it was very difficult for me to make the relationship to death because you had to go like a lot further. But I have no doubt that it is because they actually don't stop. For example, there was this woman that said, "Well, one day I woke up and I didn't see." Yeah, I was blind. Can you say? <laughs> <laughs> so what did you did you did? Oh no, um, I called work first. I uh, I prepared the kids to go to school, and then well, I thought maybe I have to call someone. And you say, well, <laughs> she was blind, like, <laughs> and it was about diabetes. So it was about diabetes. She had a diabetes that went so far. So what they they did was they gave her me medicine and everything, but she's will eat candy for example she had it in her pocket yeah. because it was gas she worked with little children so yeah. maybe a lot of times she didn't have time to eat yeah. so she will get like that but it was candy and she was she had diabetes so you see that she function she mm -hmm. was literally what i saw uh what is health and everything is that they will because of the urgency they will concentrate only in the present tasks yeah, for yeah. example eat Mm -hmm. Oye, pero, and hydrate. Mm -hmm. Yes, in English. 
Uh, in, in a context of the career científica. Uh, in the context of academic career. Research, I also study the career trajectory of women, successful mm -hmm. women in science mm -hmm. uh, with children. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, fantasiaban. They fantasize. But they're both to die. No, no, no. <laughs> That uh, they even they even look at the fantasies about going mad, like losing their mind. Ah, only when I la fantasía de enloquecer y desaparecer de este mundo era algo común. The fantasy about like going crazy and disappearing from the world was like frequent. So interesting to me because um, I mean, it's something that I work on and. So when we think of care through a relational framework, um, I think the premise is that ethics comes from being in entanglement, being in relation. But I think that if some people were to talk about um, maybe care or thinking of ethics coming from unrelation or indifference or exclusion. So for example, mm. maybe care in that sense would be to not care, to, to self care would be to not care anymore, to give up or to die. Yeah. We cut people off. Like um, I think Karen Grant is from Asia to cut. We cut them off and in that way they really mm. can thrive better when we cut people off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, 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 I I'm actually I agree with you. I think there's this, there's a like, uh, optimism about like every part of the entanglement that become entangled. It's like better, like what we're just saying. Like the better, the better, the, the like the more the better. Uh, and actually, like maybe some entanglements are just not caring, and you should like remove yourself and recreate some kind of entanglements somewhere else. And it's it's, it's fair because some entanglements require from for them to to blossom, require some for things to die as well. So, so it's I mean, yeah. Yeah. But to be honest, yes, not necessarily in a, in a violent way, but in a nice way, in a caring way. It's a kind of way of destroying things that mm. are strange. Yeah. But, but I think the problem is, is that sometimes you cannot describe it mm -hmm. because of your position. Yeah. Oh, there's so, a... Marta, well, I'm going to say there's a magic, but she cannot kill her daughters. <laughs> like, like, remove from her. No, she can remove herself. I mean, she, she can, can. But, but it comes with a price. Like, I'm going to yeah, leave my family. It's the daughter survival. Like, yeah, the, yeah. the daughter has five. You cannot remove no, yourself that's, from that's, there. Like, that she's is, not going to yeah. eat uh, because of uh, economic precarity. You know, you need everyone to be working. So she cannot remove from her job. Mm. Uh, if she removes for, from taking her, her daughter to school, maybe I think. Uh, one of the things you have is maybe but, you you need a, a wider network. Yeah, but I was just thinking about the uh, I was thinking about like you get a lot of in academic careers, right? Like people that go through the PhD experience and like applying to funding and postdocs and everything, and you get a lot of these accounts. Like, I don't know on Twitter stuff. Like the day I left academia was the best day in my life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there are people that remove themselves from that entanglement. The gente que se retira dice, me salí de la academia, bueno, mejor decisión de mi vida. Mm -hmm. So, so in that case, yes, like, yeah. and you don't necessarily have a, a pre-set like network in which to let yourself go, but uh, you can, I mean, you, you create it in the process. I'm not saying that's the answer, but but I, I kind of agree that there's some yeah, entanglements very that similar to what she that I actually have a question. I think solidarity that you put, if it was the same among women and men, because you will think that the most logical thing will be to incorporate men into mm -hmm. the network, right? Because mm -hmm. they have it's a resource, they have more mm -hmm. time, they have more resources. But what ends happening is that because of uh, women are the one in the in the position. Uh, in another similar position, when women ask for help, they ask another woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, because it's easier, she gets it. You, you don't have to explain it. And because you are in a hurry, she, it's easier to ask for mm -hmm. another woman. So uh, what tends to happen if, if you have a network, it tends to be a feminine network anyhow. Mm -hmm. To create a network where you will include men, I think it's so, uh, it will be so much work that mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's not worth it probably for most women mm -hmm. but it has to do when you ask something for for example from the husband you have to send like a list with everything you need you have to explain everything so it's so much 
it, it's so wonderful. <laughs> I, I, I'm not feeling yeah, no, that's, I, I don't know. touched by this <laughs> particular matter. But, but, what, yeah. You know, that's the problem. You, when you ask them, well, does he? No, he, he's busy. He doesn't get it. So it's easier to rely again on another woman. I was going to ask you if you have the same thing on academia. I'm thinking because it was, for example, someone that was pregnant. Mm. Women rely more on another woman if, or you have like. Yes, but eh, a medida que avanza la carrera, through the career, eh, las mujeres se sienten cada vez más solas. They keep feeling more and more lonely. But they are lonely because they're less women. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's feeling a feeling of another being. Entonces reemplazan. So they replace uh, female co-workers by male co-workers. Sí. Y, y aún así construyen un espacio de intimidad con los compañeros. Uh, and despite that, they can create this like intimacy space with the co-workers, male co-workers as well. Sí. Eh, yeah, I was like going sí, back pero, to... Por ejemplo, lo que yo sí puedo comparar de, de esto con la Ale, porque con la Ale es que la... Eh, las mujeres que habitan la academia. The way I can cope with her is that women that eh, habit the academy, like work academy. Efectivamente viven un, en un espacio androcéntrico. They do live in an androcentric space. Mm -hmm. Pero silenciado. But por, silence. Por el método. Eh, ¿Cómo se llama? ¿Qué cosa? La objetividad, como la. Por el método científico y la idea como eh, ah, de, 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 ah, but it's, it's an androcentric world, but it's silenced by the this bureaucracy of the management and stuff. Entonces, para mí ha sido súper importante preguntarme cómo eh, eh, autores que pertenecen a grupos minoritarios. So for me has been really important to think about how uh, authors that belong to minorities tienen la potencia de decir cosas. Eh, verdades, have the power ciencia. to speak truths about science en espacios que no son suyos. in spaces that they don't belong to them. No, ellos viven permanentemente en la frontera, they live epistémica. constantly on the border, like in the epistemic, epistemic border. Yeah, mm -hmm. The women's uh, migrants. Um, mm. ¿Cómo? Los Con nosotros, oh, all of us in the South. Um, Yeah, but, pero es una potencia, mm -hmm. no necesariamente una debilidad. Ah, oh, that's a strength. It's not necessarily a weakness. Yeah, yeah. it could be. Porque tienen la capacidad de hablar muchos idiomas epistémicamente. Yeah, but they can speak a lot of like epistemic languages. And positions. Um, yeah. From different positions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Entonces yo como que veo lo de la ALE, pero también veo la, la potencia de ese esfuerzo. So I, so I, yeah, I can relate to her experience, but I also see that the, the strength in the in this exercise, like. Right? Describing hair is such an important, like, analytic for looking at spaces that you work with, because unlike the other, yeah, like how care is, um, it's not innocent, right? But then through these care regulations in the, the scholarship or the, mm -hmm. the academic the academic fields that you work in. Like it can point to like these different moments that we can sort of like think otherwise, I think. Um yeah, so it's I think it's really interesting that you're working with care in these spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I pronounce it? Yeah, no. Ah, gracias. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if you're not comfortable with it. Well, sure. Sure, yeah. I <laughs> I have a focus on Latin and I kind of focus on civil languages in general. Mm -hmm. So, catch some of the stuff you say. My point will be is this is the way out of uh, theories, uh, something already concrete in practice. Already. 
you are expectation or you treat some speed greater than that. So you think that the good thing is to report so what we took advantage of uh something that is happening at the moment that uh, there's a change in the laws in chile and children's point of view and experience must be included in planning and different things so it's something that is happening but it's not done yet and there's like this debate about how to do it so we, we kind of feel the gap like at the beginning. Yes. So I can agree every computer you are saying about the power relations between mm. the user and the design. Mm. And in Taiwan, they from Taiwan. Also Catholic Queens. <laughs> and I started in Rural, Minnesota. They don't have this kind of problem as a Taiwan. Mm. And uh, most of the policy makers well educated. Everywhere, mm. so they know the connection of the best known architect. Mm. So their design is excellent. Mm. But ordinary people say, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> "That's it." So in in Taiwanese event, Taiwanese money, but build up something for international famous. It's not a for local basic need. Mm. That was a big problem. Yeah, even ordinary people see it, cannot jump up. It's for me. And the Taiwan said, we are a democratic country. Yes, that's the direction. But another in local participation. Local participation will be monopolized by certain groups. Mm. Their group is very powerful in village in Great. They mm. concern their family interests, not the child of the family. Yeah, so, yeah. So I kind of appreciate that your urban space can incorporate the need of the needy people, especially in China. I'm kind of surprised. Mm. Is that true? Ninety percent of the kids in the city, yeah. Yeah. So they live in the island, I building, smaller. Go to babies the every day like for eight hours. Mm -hmm. Their parents spend most of the time in work, yeah. making money or raise the kid by other people's hands. Basically, yes. <laughs> you describe it very good. So they are not a problem. I said that away from the nature. Of course. So when they when they grow up, their minds mm. are narrow because I used to live in the farm place. So I have many many friends. <laughs> they come to me just hey, no one. <laughs> just go out to work. Now use computer and use a phone. <laughs> no interaction at all. That will be suffering in the coming generation. So some certain place would be enjoyable, but in the major city, in the rich area, mm. only. So if your idea go, goes out and it comes true, that will take some of the local people, from yeah. particularly in the ordinary, middle, middle, or lower middle class, they will get a space to play and work. Yeah. So <laughs> Thank you. You get this idea, but haven't reached that point. And some people begin to do it. Mm. How many cases? How big of the difference? Right now, the research, of the research. Uh, I mean, you say, since going on now, and uh, how much going in the one case, two case? With the, uh, with the interviews? Yeah. We had like 12 interviews by now, two experts, 12, 12, two, two experts and urban planners in different cities. Yeah, because the project uh, is supposed to cover three cities in three different regions. In the several countries, we call the primary city. Primary city. Yeah. The city is super big and other resources are attention. The second largest city, like Bangkok and Chiang Mai. 17 times smaller. Oh, wow. Different than what Yeah, of course. Well, Chile is a very small country compared to the whole thing by one or any other country. Uh, we're about 16 million people in total, 16, 16. And half of the population is. So that would be a bit of the definition of a primary city. Yeah. Then that's the other one. And then the other ones are a lot smaller. Um, 
Yeah, I, I would say that for me, um, we, we have like a very serious lack of public uh, politics in many, many ends. Um, so, one of the reasons I raised this question because I grew up in the second largest city in Taiwan. When I get an admission from the college, I get into the capital city. I see, wow, that's so big. <laughs> The same nation, same language, but they are culture. Yeah. They are but it changes, yeah. Finding business, friendship, just a very big difference. So I need to take a time to really adjust. Mm. I don't like that because it's too much calculation mm. to mm. emphasize on some certain things, not based on yeah. the form of the relation of the friendship. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, he is moving for a more nice form of public policy, so the board thing was centralized. So, it's one point that we have a lot of people who are very good idea, and then we lost to a small state in the mm. Now, we are currently thinking okay, maybe we should be local, uh, and decisions should be planned in, in a different way each way. Mm. Um, so we are kind of taking advantage of that as well. And to do that, that's when it's really so anything that can tell the situation further, we have to do some check. Finish number one. Take it down. Caregivers. I used to spend the whole year to investigate the caregivers in Taiwan. Caregiver mm -hmm. for 40 neighbors from Malaysia, from Singapore, not from Singapore. Uh, we import body labor from Indonesia and the Thailand, maybe 500 or so different. That's a big population. So even each small town have a body labor for caregiver or elder. And uh, a friend of mine, close uh, a student, and uh, she worked for a British people's take care of their kid. Mm -hmm. And so she gave me some information every couple of weeks what did she do and how many things she learned. They give her a big amount mm -hmm. times than the previous work. But her description not on her work mm -hmm. take care of the kid two years old, one years old. Just like you say. <laughs> and uh, all time and uh, she cannot just if, if this kid wake up and uh, if this kid wake up a couple hours, so she may be and take a nap one hour, even in the day shift, night shift the same. So when I, I would come in, I did not question anything because I don't very know about caregiver in the care relationship. Mm -hmm. I would say caregiver's population is going, growing up. Mm -hmm. And this growing up population will diversify because a lot of our foreign neighbors move in. Mm. So some caregiver, she speak English better than uh, mm. local Chinese, Taiwanese college graduate. Mm. So she can talk to kid English directly, which is nice. But this kid is not go out to work. And I grandma say, you have to be here, here is with the identified caregiver of the, the mother. Mm. So this relation will be getting complicated mm. compared with the next generation care of their kids. So there are no other intervention now since different. Mm. And this is since universe, if the Taiwan is here, she is like a caregiver and a mm. caring relations that will be kind of big component of the child or experience. Mm. And this relation will be, be tender what I cannot imagine, but it doesn't go in. Mm. 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 Ah. Mm. 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 What has central, only ten percent, I think, of uh, people in Chile have uh, has domestic paid help. 
uh, it has tend to be replaced by uh, external services, for example, schools. And, uh, they're, they're, and, and, and schools are very like, uh, they're, they're take care, they, 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 we use them as carrying mm. uh, facilities. Like yeah. The most important part of school today in Chile has to do with the kid having a space to be in where when the parents work. Um, yeah, 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 but that's that's the main function. We we it was very uh, clear when we had the pandemic. We, yeah, we, we did a study about that. Like, uh, and when when children stopped going to school, well, the mothers were us were the first ones to take in the where the responsibilities and what to do with the kids. And then we have some uh, what was what has also started to happen is that the paid work started being. Down, down by immigrants, but South immigrants. So there are many times they are unpaid, um, they're in, 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 in an illegal situation. So people many times take advantage of them. So it, it usually it's not uh, something like, um, like for example, they will learn English with, no, no. It, it's more of, of uh, a way of, um, solving even kind of a handicap like oh i really don't i really cannot do this and i'm gonna unpay someone else because i'm gonna pay them but i'm probably not gonna pay them it's not it's never like a big uh salary or anything i'm just gonna pay as a way of uh unburdening as well. mm. that, that that will be an only 10 percent of population have access today I I, is social complex enough by the I cannot follow you completely, but I kind of thinking the cutting question for you is, is there any, is there, are there many cases in Chile for urban middle class kids? They have a newborn baby, they cannot take care of them, but they send them back to their grandfather, grandparent, that they are elder generation take care of their kids. Uh -huh. No, many times they help, and if they help, it's the grandmother that helps. Usually, the grandfather doesn't help. What happens a lot in Chile is that people try to live close. That that that's a very like so so they can help, but not necessarily like take them in. Sometimes they help with some tasks. For example, they cook or, so they, or they take care. Take care of each other, patient. Yeah, but sure. Yes, we have to leave the the room. Sorry, uh, because somebody was like coming in and just realized. Yeah. Yes, yes. You <laughs> are saying a general way of a scientific book. That's my interpretation. The growing scientific community number. How many PhD? How many program? That's good. How many citations in publication in the first read class of a text? I don't know how much people, how many countries do that, but certainly understand that we are saying something in Taiwan. And uh, I, a year, a year or two years ago, we have a um, political competition mm -hmm. pattern. So they find both each other. One professor in National Taiwan University, the top one, one professor. Get a 25 master degree thesis finish in one year time. And under his advice, see 250 probably master thesis. So some local people want to become a senator or become a mayor for election success, success mm -hmm. in election. They need a mm -hmm. better degree, National Taiwan University Master of Health. So come in and he just <laughs> now he has a data because newspaper print these things every day. This is all this is all and blah 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 blah. So they are going down. That's a scientific community and a political community. Mm. Not just cause give it a name that's institutionalized mm. in a such a prestigious institution. Mm. Which is the same because I know this people. He used to be a gentleman. <laughs> used to. <laughs> used to. Yeah. 30 years ago, 30 years ago. Now, 
Ya. Yeah. Ya. Okay. Es científico, como está pensando, que es como porque en el fondo hay un caso, hay varios casos de como corrupción en el mundo académico. Ah, ok, ya, yeah, ya. Yeah. Es una relación en donde ya donde fraude. I have this question, like this relation between like fraud or solidarity, like what, what is it a, a lot of times? Uh, it has to do with how we research as researchers, how we research ourselves. Coming our own research. Mira, eh, el, Fraud. Un, o la trampa. Or cheat. Eh, o el abuso. Or abuse. O eh, las mentiras. Or lying. Eh, las entender como formas de sobrevivencia. We can understand them under this situation as forms of survival. O sea, si el sistema, lo obvio es pensar que la gente va a ser que uno sobrevive. Yeah, uh, she says, she thinks it's more about a system, that the system is tricky and hard to navigate. If the system is too, yeah, if the system is stressful and too high demanding, it's kind of obvious that people are going to end up tricking the system somehow to survive. The system. So they do everything they can. Okay. Thank you guys, and we have to wrap it up. Thanks so much for your presence. And uh, I don't know.